So, uh, welcome to the Cilium Update session. Were any of you at CiliumCon yesterday? Yes? Awesome, right? It was good. So, first section today is just a little welcome to Cilium session. How many of you are already using Cilium? Most of you, good, so you probably mostly know what Cilium is. Very quickly, you, most of you probably use it as a CNI, so providing networking in Kubernetes. Cilium Service Mesh, which is extending that to service mesh capabilities using eBPF and, and highlighting the capabilities of Cilium as a networking platform. Hubble for observability, and we're going to hear a little bit more about Hubble and observability and Grafana integration later in this session. And of course, Tetragon. So let's get another show of hands. How many of you have tried Tetragon or been interested in Tetragon? Okay, so Tetragon is the security observability sub project in Cilium. I highly recommend you check it out. Really, very briefly, Cilium you know, covers. Kubernetes networking in a really performant fashion because it's based on eBPF. Really high performance load balancing. We have users who are using it outside of Kubernetes as a load balancing platform. Security aspects around network policy and transparent encryption. And of course, the ability to integrate multiple Kubernetes clusters and external workloads. That is another thing that you will hear more about from Thomas shortly. Hubble is the observability platform that gives us visibility into individual network flows, aggregated metrics, service maps, and the ability to export all this metric information to whatever you want to export it to, whether it's FluentD or Prometheus or Grafana, Elastic, whatever SIM you're using, we can use as a destination for Hubble information. And Tetragon which uses the eBPF knowledge that we have to instrument the kernel and give us insight into security relevant events. So Cilium is being used by a lot of people and we have a lot of um, use case studies, videos, blog posts, and people describing how they're using Cilium that you can find on the Cilium website. We've already got over 100 end users documented publicly in the users file. Is there anybody here who is using Cilium but hasn't added themselves to the users file? Nobody wants to confess to that. There's somebody who's confessed. Right, so you need to go to the users.md file and submit a pull request to add your organization. And uh, you know we're seeing that number explode. Brilliant. You can use eBPF in basically any cloud environment. And in fact, it's being adopted by all the major cloud providers. AWS use it for EKS Anywhere. Azure use it for the Azure CNI powered by Cilium. And in Google Cloud, it's part of GKA, J, ugh, <laughs> GKE Dataplane V2. All of this information and more we've collected together into our first annual report at the end of last year. So Bill, who I'm sure many, many of you have interacted with one way or another, pulled together this annual report, sharing all the statistics, all of the information, some of the users' stories and the news, showing the progress of Cilium up to 2022. As lots of you know, yesterday we held the first ever Cilium Con. I think it's going to be the first of many because it was great. We had some fantastic end user stories. So if you didn't make it yesterday, do check out the videos on YouTube when they're published because there are some really great talks. And the other thing that happened yesterday was we crossed a milestone. We went from slightly below 15,000 stars on GitHub at the beginning of the day to over 15,000 stars on GitHub by the end of CiliumCon. So I think that's another round of applause, right? <laughs> we now have a contributor ladder. So if you want to get involved in uh, whether it's development or other types of uh, non-code contributions to Cilium, we have guidance on 
um, you know, not just go and do a good first issue, but also what the different roles are, how you can kind of take on more responsibility within the Selim community. There's a contributors file that you can add yourself to if you're making non-code contributions. So things that otherwise wouldn't be tracked in GitHub, you can now make sure you do get the credit for that in, in GitHub. We have regular Cilium developer meetings. We've had a weekly meeting for forever, pretty much. Uh, we are now also experimenting with a probably monthly meeting in the Asia Pacific time zone so that we can extend to more people around the world. We do have quite a lot of users and contributors in Asia Pacific, so uh, really great that we can now welcome them to a, a regular meeting. And of, of course, there's always the Slack channel. Another thing that's happened since we last had an updates meeting is that we had a third party security audit. So this was commissioned by the CNCF and an organization called OzTIF. And they appointed a company called Ada Logics to do a security audit. And I think it's fair to say that Cillian passed it with flying colors. They didn't find any critical, I don't think they even found any high severity issues in the main security audit. They were very impressed with the security posture and the attitude that the maintainers have to security. So that was a really, really great milestone to have achieved and really valuable input as well. So we're grateful to the CNCF and OSTIF for providing that audit. We now have a training course. So uh, Linux Foundation are publishing an introduction to Cilium. You can already sign up for it. And uh, I think the first class of it is, is about to be run in May. And with all these things, I think, you know, we can see the end user adoption is really broad. We have uh, the governance, I think, is in really great shape. Uh, the security side of things is in really good shape. So our graduation application that uh, we put forward in Detroit, we hope we're really close to the TOC vote on that. There have been a few bits of paperwork that need to uh, get finalized. But uh, fingers crossed, we will be in a position to be graduated very shortly, I hope. Which will be amazing, and we will definitely celebrate at the next KubeCon if we have graduated by then. So that's a little summary of what's been happening in Cilium for the last, uh, you know, since the last KubeCon. I think next we should hear from someone a who can tell us about Cilium being used in the wild, tell us from the perspective of a, an end user and end user customers what their experience of using Cilium has been. So without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Andy Allred, who is a lead DevOps consultant with FECO. Welcome, Andy. All right. Hello, everybody. Oh, it's weird to hear my voice like that. <laughs> So, as Liz mentioned, I'm a lead DevOps consultant at uh, EffieCode. EffieCode is the leading DevOps consulting uh, company in Northern Europe, and we're trying to expand that. We help companies modernize and upgrade and move to the cloud, or at least move to more cloud-native-like thinking in their operations and their technologies. Uh, I want to tell you two stories about my use of Cilium. The first one is the first time I use Cilium, and the second one is the project I'm on right now. So the first time I used Cilium, I was in a previous company. We were doing telco billing systems, and we wanted to modernize what we had. We had, every time we deploy this, we had to deploy it to the customer's environment, which means we need to be able to deploy it to any of the three public clouds, to some partners' private clouds, on-prem with probably VMware, but who knows. We have about uh, 60 microservices. We were already on Mesos Marathon, so they were containerized, and that was good. Our data platform was on top of Cassandra. We also had MariaDB. We were using Galera. Postgres, Kudu, Impala. Please don't ask, it's a nightmare. Uh, RabbitMQ, Redis, and of course, we had, had to have Kafka there. So how are we going to modernize this and be able to deploy it to any of the clouds and on-prem and operate it the same way everywhere? Well, Kubernetes. 
Uh, it worked, we got things working, we got things up, we used various operators and controllers and got things running. We decided to use Istio for our ingress and this was great and then we just realized that, well, we would like to have, because this is sensitive information, we would like to have all of our data secure in transit. No problem, we just enable T MTLS and put sidecars everywhere. Sidecars starting up everywhere and all the kind of different operators from different providers and different types of containers and written in different languages turned into a nightmare. Like there has to be a better way. So in comes Cilium. This was 2018, so Cilium was still pretty young but uh, it seemed to work. So fantastic, or well, it wasn't fantastic, but it worked considering the constraints we had. So we have Cilium running there. We put in layer seven policies. So we were able to manage which services talk to which. And because this was layer seven, it wasn't just a drop packet when something went to the wrong place, it got an error back saying you're not authorized to do that, which made debugging a little bit easier. We still had our ingress working via Istio. The network was secure, everything was happy, no sidecars, we're good. And then I noticed one point that, hey, when we installed Cilium, we got something else here. It was Hubble. So took a look at Hubble, and that was just a really, really valuable troubleshooting tool to see and realize what traffic is flowing inside the network. So excellent. So since then, every project I've worked on, especially since I moved to being a consultant, first thing we do is let's talk about getting Cilium in there with Hubble so we have secure communications and we can see what's happening and that's just my default. The current project I'm working on is uh, for a national, nationwide bank in a European country. They have, everything is on-prem at the moment based on VMware. They have some services in the cloud in AWS. They would like to expand that and they would like also to move to Azure and have some services running there. So we've helped them set up an internal development platform. This is based on Talos, Kubernetes, and, and Linux, which lets us, using their KubeSpan, have the control planes run, control plane nodes running on-prem and worker nodes running on-prem in AWS and in, uh, in Azure. And I know this is an anti-pattern and it's a terrible idea, but it's what we need to do to fulfill the requirements and it works. We've got Backstage, we've got Argo CD, we've got uh, Argo workflows running uh, the CI pipeline, and of course we have Cilium there. We had a couple more things that we were missing. We would like to do a little bit more advanced layer seven uh, traffic modeling. Uh, we want to, we would like to uh, configure where the egress is happening a little bit better. And we would like to uh, set up, set up some ingress, or we would like to have the ingress managed inside the service mesh, not as an external thing. Around this time, Cilium service mesh was in beta. So we took that into use and that's running. So as of today, we have our multi-cloud cluster running. We have nodes running in AWS, nodes running in Azure, nodes running in virtual machines on-prem, uh, all part of the same cluster. So visibility is all through the same tool, Kube Control, you can see everything in the same. Uh, Hubble, you can see it all, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we use taints and tolerations to assign workloads in the various locations, and then we use the egress configuration for making sure that the nodes in AWS talking to AWS services use the AWS egress and Azure the same and et cetera. It's actually working quite well, and we're, we're really happy with it. So the Cilium service mesh has been really nice. Our next steps, we want to take Tetragon into use and start using that. We would like to get better visibility with Grafana, and we'll hear about more about that in just a couple minutes. And we would like to move to gateway API support because ingress configuring is a little bit icky, and uh, we would like to kind of simplify it with, with uh, gateway API, and I think that'll help us. Uh, Spiffy is something we'd like to investigate. 
And then uh, we want to check out cluster mesh and maybe the new cilia mesh, which was announced yesterday, and see if that helps us simplify things and give us the ability that we don't need a multi-cloud cluster, but we can have multiple clusters communicating nicely. That's how I'm using Cilium, and that's why I recommend it always, and it's always part of my projects. If you'd like to talk more, I'm always happy to talk about Cilium and anything around it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andy. So, uh, as he mentioned, I'd like to see more integration between Cilium and Grafana. Well... Let's welcome Richie Hartman, Director of Community from Grafana Labs, to talk about precisely that topic. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, uh, great, seg great segue from both uh, Grafana integrations and from Hubble. Just to level set, who here knows what Hubble is? Like, really used it, knows it? Okay, so roughly half. So um, at a very fundamental level, it is basically see your instrumentation insights into your network. And it can actually determine how your flows are going and all of this data is being exported into Prometheus format, where through labels you know what the source and destination is and you can also put more stuff on it, like for example, Kubernetes labels and such, which allows you to really build a deep understanding of your actual services. So, there we go. So, the thing we are announcing is a new, uh, we used to call them uh, front-end plugins. Uh, the new name is Grafana app, because it's a little bit less confusing. Um, and for the first time, you can actually get all of the power of Hubble directly from within Grafana. You don't have to use different platforms. I mean, we, we strongly believe in having one single pane of glass. We strongly believe in, in having a big tent where no matter where your data actually lives, you should be able to, to visualize it. So with this zero instrumentation, you actually do get your full network observability. You can show service graphs, including all your K uh, Kubernetes metadata. And again, this is done by basically exporting all of this into, into Prometheus. And you can go as deep or as high as you want with all of this. The nice thing about this Grafana app is it also comes with ready-made dashboards. So you don't have to start from scratch. You actually get something of value and you can get started immediately. Just install it and you get your dashboard. You see the service map, the HTTP service map, and you see the red metrics and you get all of this out of the box. Again, you can drill down deeper if you want to be like really down to the individual pod or you can just go by, by Kubernetes labels and go as deep or high in all of this as you want. And it's not just uh, a dashboard there's also an explore view. So you can really interactively drill into your data as it comes in and you can really understand what is happening and take this learning back into improving your, uh, your, your stuff, your application or your dashboards. That's it, thank you. Thank you, Richie. So uh, last, but by very means, no means least. <laughs> Let's hear about what's coming next in Cilium and what's coming down the pipeline from Thomas Graff, CTO at iSurveillance. Thank you, Liz. I'm not quite as tall as Richie there. Awesome. So uh, the Cilium journey has been amazing and we have been asking ourselves, what should be next for Cilium? Like, we've been implementing the full Kubernetes networking standards, services. We've now fully implemented Gateway API. Well, what do you want next? And we actually ran several surveys. We asked all of our 15,000 Slack members. Not all of them actually responded, but many of you did. And this is essentially what we came up with. So this is Cilium 114 and beyond. This means some of these features will actually land in 114, um, which is coming out this summer, but not all of that, or it may come out as a beta feature and will be stabilized later on. So it's a bit of a mix. I would say roughly over the next year, what is coming? First of all, MTLS for network policy. This is something we are super excited about and we'll dive a little bit deeper. So we'll keep it brief, brief for now. This is based on the Spiffy and Spire integration that we are working on that has been in the work 
for quite a while. That brings the MTLS authentication and obviously brings the certificate management into Cilium. We'll talk about that in a bit more detail as well. And then I think I can't emphasize this enough. We are really um, focusing on improving and enhancing the day two operations of Cilium because Cilium is now everywhere and we want to keep not only your life simple, but our life simple as well and have as, as few Slack incident reports, incident reports as possible. So we are involved a lot in improving day two operations. That's not just on the user experience side, but also on proactive incidents avoidance. And of course, the partnership and the collaboration with Grafana is helping a lot. We are providing the observability that you can see what is going on in Stellium, but then more importantly, actually avoid incidents. So we'll be investing a lot into proactively avoiding them by, by giving you tools that help you understand if Stellium, if your Kubernetes cluster from a networking perspective gets out of like away from the default path, away from like the good land and into like a bad shape. So you can react before incidents. But even more importantly, we are investing a lot into the resilience path and into the resilience aspect, which has been a corner mile, corner stone of Kubernetes in general. We're pretty good at this already, but we can always do better. So resilience will mean that we can recover from impacts from like unexpected behavior, maybe another component removing the eBPF programs that Cilium has installed and reinstalling them and so on and so on. Grafana dashboards and Hubble UI, we'll see a couple of additional um, dashboards and screenshots here. This is super exciting. Um, I would say we've been a bunch of kernel engineers working on Cilium and now with the Grafana team helping us out, all of a sudden we're obviously in a very good position to provide a, more, a lot more observability. We'll talk about uh, Istio ambient mesh and C-tunnel integration. How many of you have heard about Istio ambient mesh? Excellent. So Istio ambient mesh is essentially has followed the Cilium service mesh model that we announced that, that brought sidecar free service mesh. And Istio ambient mesh is pretty similar. It also brings a sidecar free service mesh based on the Istio control plane. It does not have the eBPF based implementation of some of the functionality that Cilium does, but it, it, it shares the view of removing the sidecar proxy. We have been in collaboration with several Istio team members to essentially integrate the C tunnel aspect. The C tunnel is what provides MTLS in Istio Ambient Mesh and is what redirects the traffic to the layer seven proxy to bring the C-tunnel integration directly in Cilium itself, which means that you can run Cilium with C-tunnel and then run Istio Ambient Mesh on top and you on Istio Ambient Mesh only needs to take care of the layer seven aspect. This does not or will not replace any aspect of Cilium Service Mesh, but we understand that there are use cases where Cilium Service Mesh makes sense. There are use cases where Istio Ambient Mesh makes sense and we want to provide a solution for all of you. Did we mention more Grafana dashboards already? <laughs> and we'll have a big announcement. Well, maybe some of you have heard it uh, yesterday at Cilium Con. Um, we'll talk about this as well. So diving a little bit deeper, MTLS in network policy. Our goal is to provide you with an MTLS authentication layer that is incredibly easy to use and just simply works without actually deploying something um, additionally. So not deploying a full-blown service mesh. The way this will work is that the next version of Cilium will include a spiffy inspire out of the box that you can enable, which will generate the certificates for all the services as they come up. And then you as a user, all you have to do is essentially augment your existing Cilium network policies with the two lines you see on the screen, which mean you can say, I'm no longer just allowing two pods to talk to each other based on pod labels. I want to enforce authentication, which means that instead of just requiring the network policy and then the traffic being allowed on the network level, it will actually do a authentication using MTLS. And we'll look in a minute how that actually looks like. This, of course, needs the spiffy integration. We actually have a blog about this where you can uh, dive a little bit deeper, but it is standard spiffy inspire as you have probably heard it from other talks. And then again, as I mentioned, the day, the day two operational aspects. So let's dive a little bit deeper into this MTLS uh, policy or MTLS um, based or policy implementation. How does that look like? You can take an existing system that our policy allowing traffic from A to B and you add the lines authentication required strict, 
which means that instead of just Cilium allowing this traffic on the network level, an additional MTLS authentication is required. And this is done using a new approach. It's not really new in the industry, it's new to Kubernetes. There's actually a couple of big companies, big tech companies who are doing this internally, so we have not invented this concept. We're bringing it to Kubernetes. This new MTLS model is splitting what's on the data path, that's where, that's the wire, that's where the data packets are actually going, that's where the, the data is flowing, from the TLS handshake, which means that as a pod talks to another pod, the eVPF data path controlled by Cilium will hold up the packets if the policy requires the authentication and will signal to a user space authentication agent, hey, wait a minute, I cannot go forward before you authenticate with the other side. And then two authentication agents will authenticate using MTLS and actually validate whether they should be talking to each other and whether the other peer is actually who they claim to be using spiffy provided certificates. If all of that matches, the authentication agents will push down and say, yes, you're good to go. And at that point, the data path can actually forward the traffic. And it gets even better because we can actually then use the existing IPsec and WireGuard encryption layer that's in the kernel and use the key, the secret that was negotiated in the, T in the MTLS handshake to actually encrypt. What this means is that we get native performance on the network using well-established IPsec and WireGuard, but we get encryption using per-service per service certificates. This is really awesome because it means that you can actually rotate your certificates without breaking connections. You can have a fallback where you're saying if, for example, Spiffy is down for some reason and you cannot actually bring up new, new certificates in time, you could fall back to a per-cluster right key or secret to actually still encrypt everything. So this makes the whole solution more resilient and it allows to apply MTLS for any type of network traffic, not just TCP. So whether it's STDP, UDP, multicast, whatever it is, you can apply MTLS. Hubble UI with the Grafana integration, I think we have what we've brought here is the ability to embed Grafana panels that you are familiar with from the Grafana dashboards that we have, and you can show and display them directly in Hubble UI, where you already have the service map, where you have um, all, all of the metrics already, um, where you have the flow log, so you have everything in one place, and then from the Hubble UI, you can link out to the full-blown Grafana dashboards where you can use the explore mode, the zoom in mode, and so on, but essentially, we can embed all of the Grafana dashboards in Hubble UI separately. That's it, no? No, no, no. We have an announcement. What about this announcement? What about this announcement? What, what did we want to announce? So, we, are, we have announced Cilium Mesh at, yesterday at CiliumCon. And we're framing this as the one mesh to connect them all. <laughs> What this means is that we are evolving Cilium further. So Cilium started out as Kubernetes networking, making pods in a single cluster connect to each other and talk to each other. We expanded that to multi-cluster Kubernetes networking. That's called cluster mesh. We then added service mesh, which was the layer seven awareness, layer seven load balancing and so on. And what we're now doing is essentially bringing the Cilium networking piece and the connectivity and the security and the observability to outside of Kubernetes. If you have existing virtual machines or servers or VPC or virtual networks or even like networks running BGP on-prem, you can bring them and connect all of this into the Cilium mesh, which means you can do something like this on the like shown on the picture, where you can bring, let's say, different Kubernetes clusters, maybe one running in Azure or in GKE, AKS, or uh, EKS, doesn't, doesn't matter. You could have an OpenShift cluster running on-prem. Then you might have a bunch of VMs, EC2 VMs, and you might, might have actual physical machines somewhere, or you might have a VMware data center running VMs. And you can mesh all of this, tech, all of this together using Cilium Mesh. So essentially the principle one or the goal one of Cilium Mesh is to combine all the existing components that Cilium brings. The Kubernetes networking, where we run as a CNI. Cluster Mesh, where we mesh the different clusters together. Service Mesh, which is the layer seven capability, as well as the existing ingress and egress gateways where we were able to essentially feed traffic into a cluster or into our mesh and define what machine should be used when a package should leave the mesh. 
With a new component called Transit Gateway, we're now able to deploy Cilium essentially as a virtual appliance where you can run on a virtual machine or even on a server in a physical data center and act as a router. So you essentially have like a, a box that can feed data in and out of the Cilium mesh. And this will expand Cilium networking to beyond Kubernetes. So you can get network policy, MTLS, open telemetry support, all the Grafana dashboards, all of this becomes available outside of Kubernetes as well. With that, I think we have a couple of minutes for questions because this is the last session, so I guess nobody will kick us out of the room. So why don't we get all of the, the speakers back on the, on, onto the stage and we can do a couple of questions. Thank you very much. <laughs> questions by anybody? Do we have a mic? Let's see now. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, Tomasz Borsner. So how will this work with the external workload? Uh, do, will I need some agent running on every virtual machine or will this be, for example, virtual router running in the network of my virtual machines? How will this be connected together? Yes, yeah, so the, the agent running on the virtual machine or on a server is what we had so far. This is called external workload support. What's new in Silly Mesh now is that it is essentially a router. That means it's running aside the virtual machine or the server, so you don't have to change or install anything onto your VMs. So in, a, in the cloud, in a VPC, this would reconfigure the VPC networking to attract network traffic, that the VM send traffic there. And in, on, in an on-prem network, it will run BGP to attract the traffic. So it's not an agent, this is essentially the router, uh, the router appliance. I have a question for Liz. Uh, so one of the slides uh, you, that you had, you mentioned that uh, Cilium is uh, graduating uh, CNCF pretty soon. You are excited about that. Could you maybe elaborate uh, what does that mean for Cilium? Like w w specifically what it meant for Cilium when it was part of the CNCF and now that it leaves CNCF, like what materially changes for the Cilium project? In a lot of ways, nothing. So graduation really is the CNCF putting a kind of stamp of, we believe this is like de-risked. We think there is, um, for an end user who's trying to figure out what software components should I use in my cloud native implementation in my environment, which are the projects that are the most mature, that are the most widely adopted, that have um, essentially, the kind of, um, what do you call it, that? Uh, yeah, yeah, the crossing the chasm um, graph, where pretty much when you start to reach that um, mass adoption phase, it, is this project ready for mass adoption? And that's really what the CNCF is saying when they give the graduation stamp of approval. So, in many ways, it doesn't materially change things other than giving end users perhaps that extra sense of confidence that this is really a mature project, it's well run, and uh, it's being used widely in production. Okay. Hey, can you speak a little bit more about Tetragon and what kinds of things it can do? Because um, it's not super clear to me at this point. Not in Spanish? <laughs> no, I'm here, I'm here. Oh, you're there, sorry. <laughs> Uh, let's go back to the top. Do we have a Tetragon slide? Uh, yes, there is one. Yeah. Uh, let's go back, let's go back, let's go back. So Tetragon is eBPF-based runtime. There, uh, there we go. This is the Tetragon overview slide. So Tetragon runs as an agent, Go code, and then instruments the operating system. I'm on purpose saying operating system because it's probably not 
long until it's no longer Linux specific. Right now it is Linux specific, but eBPF has been ported to Windows. We're working really hard to also get Tetragon on Windows. So it's instrumenting the operating system to get, first of all, visibility. You can see what system calls are an application making, what files is, this, is it opening. You can monitor what capabilities does the process have. Does it run as root? Does it have the ability to delete the network interface? Can it use a raw socket? Can it, is it, does it have like root privileges in the kernel? All of this. And then based on that observability, you can feed all of that into dashboards and, and, and figure out what your applications, your system and so on uh, are actually doing. And based on that information, you can start creating rules. What should your pods and your ap applications actually allowed to perform? Should your application actually be allowed to access the authorized keys file in a home directory, like for, for SSH, or should it be able to write to the shadow file, or should it be able, should it be able to write to any file in e slash etc, or should it be able to do network calls, or, and then we can prevent malicious um, activity, so we can prevent well-known attack vectors, but you can also simply reduce what's allowed, so you can get to a least privileged security posture from a runtime perspective, only allow what your application needs. So in the case it gets compromised, it cannot just issue any system call, but only the ones it needs. So it's additional runtime security, as well as security observability. Does that make sense as a quick answer? Uh, you mentioned that um, you're going to add support for e ambient Istio mesh because you want to support the existing customers. But say if we, if I am in a position to go to a greenfield and choose whatever I want with um, MTLS being supported by Spiffy soon, is there anything else in, um, in traditional service mesh that is missing from Cilium the way it is now? And um, specifically, the question I'm asking, because I know you, you've been talking that Cilium uh, uh, does not have the idea of um, implementing another control plane for the, Cilium, for the service mesh, instead focusing on the data path. So in the current, uh, what you've presented, 1.14 uh, 1 and beyond, is there anything missing? Is there anything that I want from traditional service mesh to implement in the, in the new Kubernetes setup or in a new cloud native uh, uh, stack? Great question. Yes, so the data path itself is Envoy based in both the case of Istio, Istio Ambient Mesh and Cilium. And Cilium can then perform some of the activity in eBPF more effectively. So there's actually no difference in what the data path itself can do. Cilium can sometimes do it more effectively. The difference is on the control plane side. Istio, the primary way of configuring Istio is through Istio CRDs, custom resources that define how you define the load balancing, the MTLS, what you want to see from an observability perspective. Cilium does not implement Istio CRDs. Cilium uses Gateway API, which is a new standard that is arising in Kubernetes, which is implementing most of that, but not quite all of it. So the one aspect that Cilium Service Mesh does not implement today and that is not on a roadmap right now, although if you, if you want it, feel free to talk to us, and we, we were definitely, we will um, considering it, is the support for Istio CRDs. So if you're out there right now and you're using Istio CRDs to configure Istio or, or Istio Ambient Mesh, then you cannot use that in the same way using Cilium Service Mesh. But if you're using, for example, Gateway API through the Gamma project, then both Istio Ambient Mesh and Cilium Service Mesh would implement the same standard. Cilium could do that more effectively. If you look at purely MTLS, so if your motivation is to deploy a service mesh primarily from an observability or an MTLS perspective, then you can simply use Cilium without any service mesh. Even without Cilium service mesh, you get the layer seven observability with Hubble, and you get MTLS using the network policy implementation with, with, uh, with Spiffy. So overall, I think we are integrating where it makes sense. The piece that we most likely will not implement are the Istio CRDs because they're quite complex. There's a lot of them. And the feedback, at least to us, was that we want something that is simpler. Does that help? With... Maybe we have, I think we have a follow-up question. <laughs> I think we have a, a small follow-up question. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think one, th one thing is not quite clear for me is that if I don't want Istio, but I want uh, everything that you, you would want in the enterprise cloud solution, you want uh, connections, you want uh, policy segregation and uh, authorization and all these things, why would I want Istio? You're putting me in a very challenging situation. <laughs> Thomas can't say this, but I will. You don't want Istio, you want Cilium. <laughs> so I, I cannot, actually, I think from a functionality perspective, we can almost do everything, right? like very close. Um, and Cilium has what's called Envoy CRD, which gives raw access to all the capability that Envoy provides, and you can implement everything that Istio does via that as well, if you want to. Um, I just don't want to make the statement that you should not use Istio because that's totally fine. We even have an Istio integration in Cilium and both can run nicely together. I strongly believe that it should be end users picking the solutions and not the people that create the solutions. Uh, I have a quick question about the um, Cilium mesh that was just announced and how you have the gateway mentioned. You used an example where you'd said you'd have a gateway box in a private cloud or public cloud that was essentially receiving announced PGP announcements from that cloud and then attracting traffic for uh, assuming consumers to be getting up to remote cloud edge systems um, that you're hosting in uh, Cilium uh, Kubernetes Cilium systems. Mesh. Is there, to take that idea and abstract it a little bit, you're looking at like a SDN with BGP in these situations. What about the idea of saying Cilium becomes transit for networks that are disparate across different cloud providers? Is that, you talk about BGP, how much tuning and how much is available there with the networking protocols to be able to find something like that? Yeah, that's a great question. If we would rephrase or rename Cilium Mesh, it could be intent-based software-defined networking where the intent is defined using Kubernetes CRDs instead of something like OpenFlow. It is essential, like Cilium is generic networking. You can program it. We can do a sort of six based overlays. You can do VRF. We can do, uh, we can do Geneva overlays. Uh, we can do micro segmentation fully distributed. All of that is intent based. In the Kubernetes land, nobody wants to call it SDN, but it, <laughs> essentially it is, it is an SDN. So if you want to see this in, as, as an SDN, totally fine. Like most of the Cilium team has been working on SDN solutions before. Um, most of us has, have, have worked on Open vSwitch, which was the defining project during the network virtualization age. Um, it's definitely implementing the same functionality. That's just not what the cloud native world calls it, but it's functionality wise a full equivalent and better. Last call for questions. Okay, I think it's probably time for the um, booth crawl. <laughs> <laughs>